All right, so we're in week five of our Psalms series, and um, we've been walking through just kind of some concepts in Psalms. Um, a, a lot of it is writings from King David, so if you missed any of those, you can go to creekside.church, click on our um, watch this or our YouTube channel. There's a couple different places you can get to that, but go back and catch up on that. We've talked about hungering for God's Word. We've talked about uh, justice and righteousness. We've talked about... Um, what else have we talked about? Uh, we talked about, yeah, the, the whole uh, justice situation with kind of our, our, our current times. Um, and then there's a few more that I'm forgetting, so I'm just going to move on. Um, but go back and watch it, because I don't even remember. I'm going to go back and watch it with you. So I'll join you, and we'll, we'll, we'll do that together. Um, but today I want to kind of go into a bizarre um, psalm. It's an 82. So we're going to be in Psalm 82. It's eight verses. I'll, I'll read through that in just a second. But then I'm hoping to summarize um, something really, really cool that God has shown me. And I don't say this arrogantly at all, so please, you know, n know my heart of, of humility. I've been a pastor for a long time. I've read a lot of books. I've studied the scripture a lot. I've watched a ton of podcasts. I've been to seminary and had, you know, collegiate training on Bible and theology and, and all of these things. But I read a book called Supernatural by Dr. Heiser. Make a note of that. This is a great resource to read. He wrote a book called Unseen Realm. He's got a book on demons and angels. And, um, but one, the, the concept that I'm going to talk about today was something that I learned from the book called Supernatural. Also, Unseen Realm is kind of his um, more in-depth study on that. But he opened my eyes to something I literally have never heard and seen before. Like, it, it was amazing to me. And that, that rarely happens where there's concepts and things that I'm learning that I've literally never seen or heard before. And, and I'll be honest with you, I'm a little skeptical sometimes. It's like if you've never heard of it before and nobody else is saying it, then probably be aware of it. But as I've actually dug into this, man, it is so biblically solid. And what I love about it is it gives us a little bit of insight to what he calls the unseen realm, or you've heard spiritual realm, or heavenly places, or, you know, we know that God doesn't dwell in this physical space, and we talk a lot about the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven, we talk about spiritual darkness, and, and all those things, and we're going to read a lot of these verses. But what my hope is today is that we would actually grab a hold of this so that we can understand, and I hope that it shifts just the way that you think um, I hope that it gives you a hunger to actually dig into stuff like this because there is endless knowledge to know about God. Like when we talk about reading the scriptures and knowing God's word, it's not just so that you can check a box of like good Christians do this. We have quiet time and we read 15 minutes or a Bible plan or whatever. Like, no, the point is, is to know God. The, the point is, is that the truth of God is powerful and it actually can transform your mind. It can transform your thoughts. And, and once you change your view of God and what you believe, everything that you believe and do comes from your view of God. So whatever your view of God is, it's going to determine what you believe. And then what you believe determines the way that you live. And so it's very important to be on a journey of constantly learning who God is. There's so much in here. Let's go to Psalm 82. Let me read this kind of bizarre psalm, and then we'll break this down. Verse 1. God has taken his place in the divine council. In the midst of the gods, he holds judgment. How long will you judge unjustly and show partiality to the wicked? Selah. Give justice to the weak and the fatherless. Maintain the right of the afflicted and the destitute. Rescue the weak and the needy. Deliver them from the hand of the wicked. They have neither knowledge nor understanding. They walk about in darkness. All the foundations of the earth, of the earth are shaken. I say you are gods, sons of the Most High, all of you. Nevertheless, like men... You shall die and fall like any prince. And then he closes the psalm with, Arise, O God, judge the earth, for you shall inherit all the nations. So I would say read that back. Really think through some of the, the language here. Number one, God is seated in some sort of divine council. So that's a little weird. 
Google that, look that up. There's a lot of depth on that. But what does that mean? Well, we're going to talk about that. Then he says, in the midst of the gods. So he's seated in a divine council in the midst of the gods. Okay, so some of you, if you grew up in church at all, as soon as you say that, if you have any like theological training at all, there's like red flags jumping up. Is he talking about polytheism? Are there multiple gods? Are there, you know, I thought there was only one God. Scripture says there's only, you know, that, that there's, there's only one creator God and no one is besides him. And all of that is true. There is only one God of Israel, one God of the universe, one creator God that every single thing that was made is his. He has attributes of Yahweh, the God of Israel, that no other little G God has. If you look in your Bible, you're going to find little G gods all throughout it. And for, for many scholars for many years, a lot of people, because of this defense that we're not polytheistic, meaning that there's multiple gods, that there's only one God, for, for many people, we, we've taken this as like idols, and you'll see that they make carved images and represent all these other gods and all this stuff. And so sometimes we've limited these little g-gods to just be like little carved things that we pretend are gods. But in this psalm, the writer, based on his worldview, based on his understanding of the spiritual realm, says God has taken his place in the divine council. In the midst of the gods, he holds judgment. And then the quotations start in this judgment. He's judging these other little G gods. And that word G-O-D is Elohim, which means disembodied spirits. It's a spiritual being. And so we know there's angels. We know there's this heavenly host. We read about stuff all the time. So this shouldn't be too hard to comprehend. There are spiritual beings in the spiritual realm. And God is standing in the council of them. And he begins to judge these other gods. It's really bizarre. But what is the divine council? What is the midst of the other gods? And then what does it mean for him to actually judge these other gods? He's judging them for what? What does that mean? So again, just a little context behind all this. My hope is is that we're going to look at this like Dr. Heiser did. And and again, he was a college student in theology of the Old Testament. He read this psalm, and literally he was shaken inside because he's like, I swear I'm reading something that I've never read before, that there's other gods, there's a divine council, that God is judging these spiritual beings. He theologically didn't know what to do with it, so began his life journey of actually studying the spiritual realm. Look him up. He's got some amazing stuff. Here's my hope today, that understanding the spiritual realm will give us a backdrop and a worldview that explains our understanding of the cosmic story of God versus evil. Like there is a true cosmic battle happening right now and always has been between God and evil. And I believe, again, my, my prayer was specific before we started here, the enemy, darkness, principalities, demons, the devil does not want you to know that you are in a spiritual battle. If you could see the unseen realm and all the things that are actually happening in heaven right now, number one, we probably would just like lose our minds and like implode or something. I I don't know. But I promise you, we would, we would look different. We, We would be hypersensitive and aware of the things that are going on. We, we would see the world in a very, very different way, and, and I promise you we wouldn't chill as much as we chill. Now, I'm down to chill. I love chilling. July 6th, going to Mexico, going to be chilling, right? And I think God wants us to enjoy these things, so don't, don't hear me wrong. I just want you to know that we are in a battle. There's a spiritual realm, and there's some really, really freaky, creepy things going on. But it also explains, I mean, I don't know if you've ever questioned God or just like watched the news or read history or looked like there's a lot of evil things happening in the world too. There's a lot of broken, like brokenness and and just evil all across the globe. Well, this helps you put some frameworks around why are these things happening? Like what's actually going on? Is it really just bad people doing bad things? No, there's a lot more going on than we could possibly understand. I'm going to walk through all the way back from Genesis 1, just a couple key scriptures to hopefully frame this. And again, this is like an, this is, this is an appetizer. 
And, and I'm hoping that something stirs in you of like, man, I need to read my Bible more. <laughs> I need to dig into this. Probably should know this stuff. Well, I'm just going to give you some references and start your wheels to spin. Genesis 1, chapter 26. So God had just created everything. You have the six days of creation. On the seventh day, he rested. And then you see it go back and then talk about him actually making human beings. Listen to this. This is so weird. And this is good. This is the first, like, challenge for you. Then God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. Who's he talking to? Who's he talking about? And who is the us? Now, a lot of you, if you grew up in Sunday school, maybe you asked that question because it was a little bizarre. And I know in the church that I grew up in, oh, that's the Holy Spirit, Jesus, and the Father. That's a trinity that people take this as a trinity. But it doesn't say that. Matter of fact, the scripture never uses the word trinity. That's a theology we've created around the way we talk about the Godhead and the Spirit and Jesus which I obviously believe in that. It's one of the creeds of the faith. It's very important to believe in the Trinity. But in this passage, then God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish and the sea and over the birds and the heavens and over the livestock and over all the earth and every creepy, creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So that's in Genesis 1. There's this us creating human beings in their likeness. Really bizarre. Just let that sit in for a minute. Then you walk through and you get to Genesis 6, and it actually gets really kind of weird. Let me just read Genesis 6, 1 through 2. So you see after um, man started to multiply. So God told Adam and Eve, I want you to be fruitful and multiply. And so you see the population of earth beginning to get really, really big. We pick it up in six. It says, when man began to multiply on the face of the earth and daughters were born to them, this phrase is really important. It was also in the psalm. The sons of God saw that the daughters of man were attractive and they, look, and they took as their wives as they chose. Again, this is really, really bizarre. So people began to multiply. Sons of God, if you do a study on that, are spiritual beings that you see, you know, you'll see in like Isaiah, you'll see in some of the Old Testament, it's like the whole Satan falling, angels coming, like there was this dwelling place of spiritual beings actually in this place. I'm going to read another scripture here in just a second. But it says, the sons of God saw the daughters of men and began to take them as their wives. So there's this really weird, like, sexual thing happening between spiritual beings and the daughters of men. Really bizarre. Let me keep going. Genesis 6, 4, just a couple verses later, it says, the Nephilim, which again is this angelic being, the Nephilim, were on the earth in those days. This was the result, and I'm just going to give you a little background. The Nephilim were literally the products of what was just happening in the verse before. It says, The Nephilim were on the earth in those days, and also afterwards, when the sons of God came into the daughters of men, they bore children to them. These were the mighty men who were of old, the men of renown. So the result of this, because of this evil that was happening, this was not okay for God. You have these spiritual beings that descended from heaven, were kicked out of heaven. You see the, you know, Satan and his angels and all these things. So now there's this intermingling somehow on earth where the sons of God are having babies with men, women, actually. Men meaning the term for humanity. So the daughters of God are being taken as wives from these Nephilim, and they're literally having children. And so in the story, you get to a really bizarre story now in Genesis 6 through 10. Does anybody else think the flood story is kind of weird? Like, why would God literally kill the entire earth and everything on it? Like, that's not a story you tell your kids as a nighttime Bible story. (laughs) You, You know what I'm saying? Like, you ever seen the little meme of the dinosaurs on top of the, the mountains? Like, oh, snap, that was today. You know what I mean? Like, it's crazy. 
The story's bizarre. God literally in judgment on the earth because of this evil that was taking place. Spiritual beings taking the the created human beings, making babies, and then the the men of renown, that's these giants, and you actually see those later because he says in that time and afterwards, so then it explains the later on stuff with like David and Goliath, like who's the nine foot dude and where did he come from? Well, so it's like this result in these giants and this whole race of evil things. Like there were actually these little demigods, if you will, running around the earth. It was, it was insane. And God in his sovereign will says this is not at all, number one, going to end up well, but I'm just going to kill everybody and I'm going to find Noah and we're going to start over. And that's exactly what you see, but it gives you some context when you understand what's going on. God's not just this wrathful dude that says, I'm just cool with killing the entire earth. He was wiping away this really weird evil that was taking place on planet earth. So spiritual beings are breeding with humans, creating giants. This is not good. So Genesis 6 through 10, you can read about the flood story. After the flood story, you then read about the descendants of Noah, right? So the the flood waters subside. Noah then begins with the same covenant that he made with Adam and Eve. I want you to be fruitful and I want you to multiply. So again, they're literally starting over humanity. After verse 10, there's this really bizarre story in Genesis 11. And if you finish the end of chapter 10, you'll see this listing of 70 some odd nations. And it literally lists the nations. Then it says that there's this tower of Babel scene where the nations are coming together. They're very powerful. They're very smart. Like they have this almost supernatural intellect where they're then building this tower, and it says they're building it up to the heavens. And this picture was they were literally trying to worship these other gods, and they were coming together in idolatry to build this tower of Babel to create this false worship. And so listen to this in Genesis 11, verse 5 through 9. And the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the children of man had built. And the Lord said, Behold, they are one people, and they have one language, and this is only the beginning of what they will do. And nothing that they propose to do will now be impossible for them. Come, let us go down there and confuse their languages. Don't miss the us. Again, God is in this like spiritual place having this conversation. Let's let us go down and confuse their language so that they may not understand one another's speech. So the Lord dispersed them from, the, uh, from there over the face of all the earth and they, and they left off building the city. Therefore, its name was called Babel because the Lord confused their language on all the earth, and from there the Lord dispensed them over the face of all the earth. So this is really, really interesting, and I'm going to connect the dots in Deuteronomy in just a second. Deuteronomy 32, if you read Heiser's work, he literally calls his main work the Deuteronomy 32 worldview, because he connects the dots of a really specific thing in 32 to this moment And you can do a lot of scholarly research. It's very clear this isn't like a new thing. He didn't just like make this up. He's not some weird prophet that just came up with all this weird stuff. This is like very easy to verify through scholarly work. So they come together. They're breeding evil. They're trying to worship this other God. They're very intelligent. And God says, let's go confuse them because this is just the beginning and this is going to get really, really bad. Their intellect has gotten so strong and their their draw towards worshiping these other gods have gotten out of hand. Let's go mix some things up. So they go and they literally mix their tongues up. And then it says he disperses them all over the earth. So there's this great divide that actually happens where he sends everybody out of this place, confuses their language. So this is where we get all these different languages. If you've ever wondered why all these nations look different and have different places and are in all these different territories, well, this is the beginning of that. Listen to Deuteronomy 32. Let me connect the dots. When the Most High gave to the nations their inheritance, when he divided mankind, he fixed the borders of the people according to the number of the sons of God. There's that phrase again. 
But the Lord's portion is his people, Jacob, in his allotted heritage. So this is really, really important. So Genesis 11, you see this Tower of Babel moment. It says and explains in Deuteronomy that as he's distributing the nations, he's doing it according to the number of the sons of God. Now, remember, he said, let us go down and stir this thing up. Then he starts dividing these 70 nations, and now the spiritual beings are involved because he says it's according to the number of the sons of God. So when you do the digging on this, and again, I don't have time to jump into this. I'm going to summarize it for you, hoping again that you'll go and verify. Please do not believe anything I'm saying today without you actually digging in God's word and figuring these things out. According to the number of the sons of God, they're being dispersed. There's territorial, spiritual beings, little g gods now governing territorial places. If you've ever wondered why all of these different nations all over the world have their religious beliefs and their sacrificial systems and all the gods that they're worshiping and all these Baals that you read about, like there's a lot of bizarre things in Scripture. This moment, if you connect the dots, they're literally being dispersed according to the number of sons of God. And and, and in this divine council, you really got to think of there's this hierarchy. So when God created everything, he created this heavenly host He created the angels. Like, that was all pre-us, you know, people and the earth and all all the things. So there was this heavenly family. There was this hierarchy. You can literally see all throughout Scripture, there's angels that have certain jobs and certain territories. And there's that bizarre passage that we shared not too long ago where uh, one of the prophets is praying and the archangel comes and he's talking about, man, I've been tied up in Persia with the king of Persia. Well, he wasn't talking about an actual physical king. He was talking about one of these guys that was literally ruling and reigning, and I've been trying to come to you for 21 days, but only me and the archangel Michael, and and you know by the language that they're not talking about humans. They're talking about the princes of these places. Notice in Psalm 82, he says, you're going to die like mere men, like mere princes, that he's taking this judgment because what was happening in Psalm 82 was after this dispersion of the nations, these spiritual beings really liked the worship. They really liked the attention that as they were kind of leading these territorial places, this is the spiritual darkness we're talking about. And I'm going to read later on passages that in the New Testament that clearly are talking about exactly what I'm saying this morning. And I hope again that it gives you just a little bit of insight. But in Psalm 82, God is judging those spiritual beings that were ruling and reigning over these territories. And why? What did he say? He said, because you haven't taken care of the poor, you haven't taken care of the needy. I'm going to go back. I'll just literally read it. Just listen to the rebuke. He says, how long will you judge unjustly? So they had authority and judgment. How long will you judge unjustly? Show partiality to the wicked. Give justice to the weak, the fatherless. Maintain the right of uh, afflictions to the destitute. Rescue the weak from the needies. Deliver them from the hand of wickedness. They have no knowledge or understanding. They walk in darkness. All the foundations of the earth are shaken. I say, you are God's, son of the most high, all of you. Nevertheless, like men, you shall die. And fall like any prince. Arise, O God, judge the earth, for you shall inherit all the nations. So again, distribution of nations. Seventy nations listed in Genesis 10. Now they're all over the earth being led poorly by these spiritual beings. And God is saying, I'm going to judge you. You didn't do what you were supposed to do. Matter of fact, you became their gods and allowed them to worship you and allowed them to, you know, put you above me because you liked the attention. Then you get to all of this um, wrapping up in Deuteronomy. They explain it. Then what's really interesting now in Genesis 12, so you tracking with me? Like, are we good? Now in Genesis 12, the very next chapter, God chooses Abraham because what he said was, but my portion, right, according to the nations, all their inheritance, according to the number of sons of God you see in Deuteronomy, then God says, but I'm going to choose my people. They're going to be my portion. I'm going to be their God. They're going to be my people. And through them, if you remember what he says to Abraham in Genesis 12, he says this, and I will make you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great. 
so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and him who dishonors you I will curse. And in you, all of the families of the earth shall be blessed. So through this one man, Abraham, he was going to create a people group that later on becomes the nation of Israel. You read the entire Old Testament and you, you, you see this is the birth of the nation. It was, it was Abram. And I'm going to number your people as the number of the stars. I'm going to be your God. You're going to be my people. And then every nation will be blessed through you. So God in that moment starts this reconciliation of the nations. All these nations were distributed amongst all these territories according to the number of the sons of God. Evil, wickedness, idolatry, false worship, false gods, false temples, all these things are happening. God then says in Psalm, I'm going to judge you because you didn't do what you were supposed to do. And you're going to die like mere men, like mere prince. So God is literally judging this divine counsel of beings that literally have not done what they're supposed to do. And then through Abraham now, he's going to build a nation. So again, having a proper view of the spiritual realm of darkness versus light, evil versus good, makes a lot of these bizarre passages that we see make sense. I mean, again, I read the Bible sometimes, and when I see entire nations being wiped out by God's people, like, what do you do with that? Have you guys ever read those stories, and you see God command Joshua to go into an entire nations and, like, hundreds of thousands of people being murdered, literally being killed, and somehow it's a righteous act of God. Well, what's he doing? Are they just really bad people? Is God just like this ruthless God who's just okay with genocide? No, there was this evil seed. There was this evil seed of literally entire nations where he would even go in. And I mean, even, you know, poor, poor animals. He was like, kill them too. Like, leave nothing Women, children, adults, their cattle, all of their stuff, like burn it all up. If you've ever read that and didn't wrestle with it, like I'm praying for you, like that's weird. But when you understand like the actual evil that exists on the earth and you understand the holiness and the righteousness of God, at some point you just have to bow down to the fact that he's God and obviously he's doing something good. Like you have to come to that place or you're going to really wrestle with just faith in general. But the reason being is because there's this cosmic war going on. There's unseen realms and things and little g gods that are like, it's really, really, really evil, really, really dark. There's a lot of bad things happening. If you've ever read even stories like, I don't know, when Moses was going to Pharaoh and Moses' staff turns into a snake you know what Pharaoh says? My boys can do that too. And he calls his musicians, uh, not musicians, his magicians, and they do the same thing. Like, have you ever read that and be like, is magic real? What just happened? Like, they literally could do it too. Their gods could do that too. So not only are there spiritual beings, they're spiritual beings that can do some really supernatural stuff. Like, it's kind of bizarre. And, you know, then Moses' snake eats their snake. And, like, you know, but God was literally saying, no, I'm bigger than you. You are powerful, but I'm more powerful. And you see bizarre stories like that. Um, you see the prophet. I love the, the battle of Baal. Do you ever remember that one? Where he literally calls down fire from heaven and burns up the bales and licks up the wall. Like, what was happening there? Was Baal a real guy? Was he a real person? Was he really a spiritual being? Or was he like a carved little piece of wood that they just claimed was a god? No, he was a little g god. He was absolutely real and absolutely territorial, leading over entire nations of people, receiving worship from people that were only supposed to worship Yahweh. And so God was proving, no, I am the God of gods. There is no other God beside me. Lay down your false gods and worship the one true God. See, Christianity is much, much more than God loving you and taking care of your sins so that you could go to heaven one day. No, he's reclaiming the nations. He's reclaiming allegiance of worshiping the one true God. It's aligning yourself in worship towards the one true creator God, the God of gods, the God of the cosmos, the God of the universe, the one true 
God. There's an epic narrative that's taking place in the spiritual realm that causes things to happen here on earth. And, and what I want you to see here is, and we talked about this in our Ephesians series, so, so just with that alone, and again, some of you are like, who is this dude and what the crap is he talking about? And that's okay. Like, we're here to learn and grow. Dig with me. Study with me. Go on a journey with me. We're going to devour God's word together. And man, there's a lot of really cool stuff in here. But now when you read Ephesians 6, listen to this, and I hope it just sounds different than when we read it three weeks ago. Paul says to the church in Ephesus, finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. So it's not just this Old Testament weird stuff we read about Paul in the New Testament to the church of Ephesus after Jesus' life, death, resurrection, ascension, after the Holy Spirit came and filled the church. They're trying to follow Jesus and build the kingdom of God. He says, our battle is not against flesh and blood, but against rulers and authorities and principalities and darknesses of evil, therefore put on the full armor of God. Be aware of of the heavenly battle that's happening. Be prepared. Have your minds right. Continue to dig into this. So why does this matter? Why does this matter? Why would I get up and share just bizarre stories? Am I just a Bible geek and love to dig? And yes, that's true. But it matters because we need to open our eyes and be open to understanding the depth of God. We need to to now understand different things of why we would come together and worship God, why we would come together and want to make disciples and see a movement of God that results in planting disciple-making churches all over the world. It's not so that we could just as Christians have something to do. Oh, build the kingdom. That sounds cool. No, no, no. It's literally redeeming the nations from the curse you see all throughout the Old Testament. All of the death, all of the blood, all of the idolatry, all the animal sacrifices, all the Jesus' life, death, resurrection. What was that about? Well, he was coming to defeat sin and death and darkness, and he was staking his claim in the kingdom of God. When Jesus arrived, he said, the kingdom is here. The kingdom is now. And when he ascended, it says he seated at the right hand of the Father and all authorities, all powers, all things under the cosmos are under him. And then us, the church, are seated with him. You, You hear me talk about that all the time. But if you don't have a worldview of this, if you don't have any type of knowledge or consciousness of the cosmic evil that's going on in the world and how God is moving in and through us, then you're going to hear that and be like, okay, what's for lunch? What are we doing later? When are we going on vacation? Man, we got that bill due. And I mean, we just get lost in crazy land of not understanding what's actually happening in the world. I want to read one more scripture in Colossians. This was Paul again. And again, I hope you would hear this now in a different form, and then I'll close with this. Colossians 1, verse 9. And this is Paul praying. He says, And so, from the day we heard, we have not ceased to pray for you, asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all spiritual wisdom. And understanding, so as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to Him, bearing fruit in every good work, increasing in knowledge of God. Be strengthened with all power according to His glorious might, for all endurance and patience with joy, giving thanks to our Father who has qualified you. Listen to this He's qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints of light. He has delivered us from the dominion of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of his beloved son in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Listen, Paul is saying, be filled with knowledge of his will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding. 
He's saying, walk in a manner worthy of Yahweh, the Lord, the God of gods. And and that looks like fruit and increasing in knowledge of God. He says, be strengthened with all power according to his glorious might. Qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints of light and delivered us from the dominion of darkness into the kingdom of Jesus. This sounds a lot more than like you're a bad person, God's good, he loves you, he died so that you could be with him one day. Like that's amazing news, don't get me wrong. The gospel, just if that's all that the book says, then man, we can praise him for all of eternity. That we were lost and he loved us and sent his son to die for us that we might be reconciled to God. Like that alone is amazing. But if the enemy, if the devil can keep your mind there, that, okay, I checked that box, said that prayer, got dunked in some water, experienced a little bit of spiritual things and his spirit and gifts and whatever, and I go to church and I go to group and I go to Bible study and I've read some stuff and I try to be a good old boy and and whatever, like, man, we've missed it. You've completely missed the fact that you're actually in a spiritual war. And that, yeah, we look all clean and, 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 and handsome and beautiful and we smell good and we sit. Remember I told you a couple weeks ago, I was sitting in a prayer meeting and God just overwhelmed me with this vision. I'm sitting in a candlelit house just praying on our face and all of a sudden the room became dark. We weren't in our nice clean clothes. We were literally bloody and battered. There were like bombs going off outside and our friends were literally exploding and dying and being brutally beaten. And like the smell wasn't good. It was really, really bad. And things were really, really dark. And God was just kind of peeling back in my mind. Like if you could really see what's going on, your sense of urgency would be a little bit different. If you really understood that you are a soldier in a cosmic battle, that you are being used by God and his spirit to redeem the entire nations back to God, you would think a little bit differently. You wouldn't worry about the things you're worried about. You wouldn't really be pursuing the things that you're pursuing. You would be open to a much larger picture of what God is actually doing. Your worship would look different. Your, your motives and your passion and your, your apathy and, and laziness or, or your sin even would look different. See, this is why we ask you to study your Bible This is why, so that you would grow in the supernatural wisdom of spiritual things, that you would pursue God and the knowledge of him so that it would continue to transform your mind. Now, again, I know this sounds really dark and weird and and, and all these things, and I do believe like God wants us to enjoy food. He wants us to enjoy relationships and, and love and peace and all the things that God brings us. But it's also in a heightened understanding of why do we pray? Why do we fast and pray? The reason God put fasting on my heart was because I read the scripture of the the man and the the demon-possessed boy that was literally physically harming him, and he's foaming at the mouth and flailing around and all this stuff, and they take him to the disciples. They pray over him. Nothing happens. Then they take him to Jesus. Lord, I took him to your boys, and they couldn't do anything. So Jesus lays his hand. He heals him. And then he calls his friends, oh, you of little faith, the reason these things aren't happening is because you're not fasting and praying. If you want to speak into the darkness and actually command them to get out of people's bodies, then you need to be prepared. You need to have your full armor of God because our battle is not against flesh and blood, but principalities and darkness and spiritual realms and some really freaky stuff. But what that does for me, and I really hope that it does for you and that you'll just hear my heart this morning. I'm not trying to be some weird scholarly like demons and dark, but it's real. The spiritual realm is real. Your prayer life matters. You fasting and prayer matters. You knowing the word of God, it matters. When we talked about hungering and thirsting for God's word in the very first Psalm that we read, it matters. Because God wants you to see more than you see. He wants you to know more than you know. You feel like you know enough because you checked a box and you're saved. Congratulations. What about everybody else? What about the six billion people on this earth? Three billion of them never have even heard the name of Jesus. Have no idea of the cosmic warfare that they're in and just being destroyed 
Our friends are being destroyed. Addiction is still even amongst us. Sin is still even amongst us. Like I preached last week, why would we confess our sins to one another? That God would heal us. Why would we be vulnerable and that God would cleanse us from all unrighteousness? It's because that's armor. When God cleanses us from our sin and we're, we're desperate for him, we abide in him and we come together with our time and our treasure and our resources and we teach the word of God and we pray and we lay hands on one another believing that God is preparing us to fulfill the mission that he's had us to do. He says, I'm going to come back. Yeah, it's going to be dark and yeah, you're going to be persecuted and yeah, some things are going to go really bad but I'm never going to leave you. I'm never going to forsake you. I've given you everything you need. Jesus came, his life, his death, all of that defeated the sin and death issue, all of our problems there. We now have the spirit, but it's not over. Our salvation is not so that we can just chill in the grace and the loving arms of God, although he is going to give us that. It's amazing. There is an abundant life. There is an abundant life that Scripture talks about. There is blessings, and there is prosperity, and there is a lot of things that Scripture tell us are a fruit of what we have, but we need to be a people that prays. We need to be a people that knows God's Word. We need to be a people that are hypersensitive to the darkness that's actually happening, which is going to require us to humble ourselves under God's Word and dig and learn this kind of stuff. Man, I can't just stand up here and preach for 45 minutes once a week and just feed you all that you need. Like, we've got to get on our face and learn about God and the epic story that is happening of God versus evil. And I love in Revelation that it says every tongue, every tribe, every nation will bow before me. Every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord, that nothing was created without him. Read the whole book of Colossians. It just blows your mind of who Jesus really was, that nothing was created without him, that he's the full supremacy of God, that the, that the fullness of God was pleased to dwell in him. That's who we worship. That's who we follow. It's his spirit that's actually leading us in this. So again, my prayer for every person in the room is that there would just be this prompting of like, wow, I probably should take this a little more seriously than I do. I probably should be a little more curious about these things than I am. Yeah, fasting and praying might be something I need to pray about doing because I'm not seeing the darkness leave my family. I'm not seeing people be healed when I pray. I'm not seeing the, the things that this abundant life and the prosperity and the blessings of God and the joy and the peace and all the things that because we are totally oblivious to the actual battle that we're in. And I believe that there's really just this powerlessness sometimes in our midst because we're oblivious of it. And again, if I'm the devil, if I'm the devil and I want to persuade you, that's exactly what I would want you not to know. Fasting and pray, you don't need that. Go to church, you don't need that. God loves you, you're saved. That spiritual stuff, like that's just for the cuckoo weird lady. Like, don't, don't worry about that. You know, you don't really need to do these things. God is gracious, God is loving. You know, don't worry about obedience. Don't, I mean, come on. Is this guy serious? It's an ancient book. It's weird. Like, no, no, no. This stuff is true and it's important and it matters. And we need to absolutely devour this stuff so that we are preparing ourselves for what's really going on. And I believe if we get this, if we begin to come together in submission to say, hey, how do we give our gifts? How do we go all in together? What, do we, what can we bring to the table to strengthen and pray for one another? How can we live in community and break bread together and study God's word together and teach one another how to boldly proclaim the gospel, teach one another how to pray, teach one another how to study the Bible? Some of you don't even know how to study the book. It's weird. We get it, but we have a way to train you and teach you and resources and all these things. Many of you don't have a prayer life, and I'm not judging you. I'm just saying maybe you've never been taught. I don't think it's your fault. I think the church for so long has not done a good job of actually equipping the saints for the work of ministry. 
There are certain things, and I can promise you, if you get the Word and you get the Scripture and you get the Holy Spirit and you get um, all the, the, the Spirit, Word, prayer, Bible, like we're going to start somewhere, and that's going to build, and God's going to take us amazing places, and we're going to fight each other's battles through prayer, and we're going to actually go into darkness and bring the light of God. But it requires us to open our eyes and to actually take this stuff seriously. So I'm going to ask Corey to come on up. We're going to sing a song in a second, and I love it. It's the Lord of hosts. You're with us, with us in the battle, with us in the fire, with us in the storm. But as we sing those words, it's not just, oh, God is mighty and he's on my side. Like, no, these things are happening. Like Jesus is truly seated at the right hand of the Father, ruling and reigning. Let's tap into the authority he's given us. Let's tap into the worship that he's called us to. Let's actually tap in to open our eyes and maybe humble ourselves to say, wow, I don't know as much as I thought I did. Oh, wow, there's a lot more to this cosmic story than maybe I knew. Oh, maybe I don't know everything. Let me dig and really find out how we're supposed to engage in this. And I really believe that the enemy is terrified of what I'm saying right now. He's terrified that there's, you know, a couple hundred people in our church that are going to come alive and start praying differently. That there's a couple hundred people that are going to turn to a couple thousand people that are going to start actually planting churches all over the world, teaching the true word of God to tap into the power to actually dispel the darkness. You see, Jesus did promise, I am going to return and I am going to finally fulfill the judgment on these spiritual beings and darkness and Satan and the monsters and, the, and the, the beasts that you read about in Revelation. Like all of that is happening. And God is going to be victorious. And Jesus did come to give you all that you need. But don't just receive his grace so that you have your get to heaven card. Like that's not what this is about. Matter of fact, like I, I pity your soul if that's your view of the gospel. And I pity us as the church if that's all we ever talk about because we're in a real battle together. And if we could see the death and the darkness and the bleeding and the, the, the casualties all around us, I just believe we would respond differently. We wouldn't worry about the things we worry about. We would be all in. We would be hypersensitive to this stuff. And so that's what I'm asking today. Would you join me in at least opening your heart and mind to say, God, teach me more of who you are? Can we listen to Paul and ask that we would be filled with knowledge of his will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding? Would we as a church begin to walk in a manner worthy of the power and the might of the Lord? Would we be fruitful and increase in the knowledge of God? Would we be strengthened in power and in his glorious might? Would we realize that we have been qualified of the inheritance of the saints of light, that we've been delivered from the dominion of darkness and into the kingdom of Jesus? You realize you've inherited a multi-billion dollar inheritance, but yet you're worried about money. Like, let's tap into what Jesus actually gave us, what Jesus is actually calling us into. Let's walk in the power and victory and authority that Jesus has accomplished for us. We've got a lot of work to do. We've got a lot of work to do. And if we don't come together, if we can't even unify around some simple truths and say, yeah, let's go all in together, then we're just playing church. And I'm not interested in playing church because my friends... People are dying around me. People are lost without hope. People are struggling. Man, we are richly blessed with the knowledge that we've even received. Can we go deeper? There is more of God to be had. There is more of his spirit to fall on this place. There is more for us to be filled there is more power and glory. There's more for us to do, but we've got to align ourselves to worship the King of Kings, the Lord of hosts, who's actually with us in this battle. Let's pray. Father, we love you. God.
God, open our eyes to see. As our eyes are closed and we look into the darkness of our eyelids, remind us of the war that's happening. God, encourage us with supernatural strength right now to not see it and to fear because your word says greater is he that's in us than he that's in the world. God, the demons are terrified. The devil in his darkness and the authorities, they're terrified. They know they're defeated. That moment that Jesus died on the cross, that moment that he rose from the dead, they felt the earth shake. They knew that they were defeated. When the Holy Spirit of God fell on this earth and started to fill the church, they were terrified. When the word of God was distributed in multiple language all over the earth, the enemy was was fighting and trying to rob and kill and destroy and deceive the nations. God, there is darkness and principalities all around this world that are like puppet masters moving in and through governments and societies and people and sin and darkness. But then there's the church, your bride, your chosen people, your promise to Abraham that every single nation, every tongue, every tribe will be blessed through Jesus, through the proclamation of the gospel, through the church actually living this out. God, let us heed the words of Paul to put on the entire armor of God. Let us walk in a a manner worthy of the Lord, his strength, his power, his might, his inheritance. God, let us receive all that you've given us. Take us deeper. Some of these things are confusing and there's all kinds of theological debates around these, but just speak to us through your word, God. Give us a supernatural hunger this morning. Every person in the room to say, no, I need to be ready. I need to know more. I need to stop debating all these silly things that have nothing to do with what you're trying to do. And God, teach us more of who you are. Fill us, God, with your Holy Spirit. Pour your gifts out on your people, God, that we would function as a healthy body, that we would honor one another, that we would radically love one another, that we would serve one another that we would take all of the resources and blessing and knowledge and wisdom that you've given us and we'd come together and say, no, let's go storm the gates of hell together and let's pray for one another and let's lift each other up. God, make us aware of your presence. Remove the veil, God, that we would see this world for what it really is. God, let us not be deceived. There's many things in this world pulling for our attention and our desires and our hopes. And God, I just pray this morning that you would reveal the truth that we need to see. And God, thank you for your grace and your patience to come alongside us, to help us continue to dig deeper, to walk alongside us and even reveal things that we just have wrong, that we've missed. Continue to teach us truth. God, let us be humble that we don't know everything about scripture, that maybe we were wrong. Maybe our church was wrong. Maybe our interpretation was wrong. God, we want ultimate truth and we know it exists in you and your spirit per your word says you will lead us in all truth and the truth will set us free. So God, teach us more of who you are. Holy Spirit, just fill this tiny church in North Paulding, Georgia. God, light us on fire that we would just consume the darkness around us. Overwhelm us, God, with who you are. Thank you for going into the battle with us and for us. Thank you for being the Lord of hosts and all spiritual realities are under you. God, lead us. Lead us. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's worship.